the hour has come. Today we celebrate the graduation of our class of 2020 in a very different way than any of us planned or wanted. The book of Ecclesiastes says, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? On a good day, enjoy good things. And on an evil day, consider both the one and the other God has made, so that no one may find the least fault with him. God knows better than we do what is best and can bring good out of what we only see is bad. And God loves to surprise us. So perhaps today is a day of surprise. The first reading today names Jesus' prized students, his apostles, and speaks about them right after their graduation. As it were, Jesus' ascension. That was the moment Jesus, their teacher, left them so that they could put into practice what he taught them. They weren't promising material to start with. There were two clusters of them fishermen from Galilee, and followers of John the Baptist, also from Galilee, which was where Jesus was from. Galilee was not where the beautiful people were from. It was not known for scholars. It did not have tier one rabbinical schools. In fact, it did not even have tier five rabbinical schools. It and its people were rather like the way we used to view Appalachia in this country. There was Andrew, brother of a fisherman and follower of John the Baptist. He was perhaps the first to recognize who Jesus was, and he wrote in his brother Peter, a married man who owned his own fishing boat. And there was James and his younger brother John, from a family of some means, but still sons of a fisherman who worked on his boat. They were first cousins of Jesus. Jesus called them sons of thunder. They were loud, precocious, ambitious, and their mother thought they were very special. They too were followers of John the Baptist, who left to follow Jesus for a while, and then went back to fishing, before suddenly giving it all up, and suddenly quitting their jobs and leaving their father on the boat. There was Philip, from the same town as Peter and Andrew, also a follower of John the Baptist, who then wrote in Bartholomew and introduced him to Jesus. And there was Matthew, despised, extorting tax collector who cooperated with the Romans. And there was Thomas, the skeptic. There was another James, also the cousin of Jesus, son of Alphaeus, and Judas, the son of James, not the Judas the Apostle who turned against Jesus. And finally, Simon the Zealot, the devout Pharisee and Jewish nationalist. In the Gospel today, Jesus says about these apostles in his prayer, I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world. Today, you graduates are going out into the world, a different world than the one you've known here, a world in which you will have more freedom and responsibility and more opportunity to build upon what you have learned in your time here. It would be sad if you have not now become different from what and how you were when you first came. Those apostles had changed from when they began. But on those first days when they were left on their own, they were hesitant and frightened. Jesus knew that they would be, so he told them to wait. In a short ten days, they were overcome by the Holy Spirit, and they became men on a mission, and they changed the world. How have you changed? And how will you change the world? We hope that while you were here with us at Portsmouth Abbey, you came to better understand yourself, your best self, and the Godness within you. But most importantly, we hope you encountered that primary face of God, the one, the only, the holy, the totally other, the perfect community of persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whom we worship here this morning. That God is the mirror in which we see and find our best selves. We truly hope and pray that you will meet and recognize the new face of God in the loving community at the college or university to which you'll be going. Now the Gospel of St. Mark says of the liberated apostles, they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them to confirm the word through accompanying signs. 
Today, you are going forth out into new and separate parts of this country and the world, and you will carry there the signs of what you stand for. I hope you will take to the places you go and to the people you meet all that you have learned here, and you have learned more than you realize, as you soon shall see for yourselves. But if you truly learn how to form and be a community, you have learned something truly important. Such unity and harmony does not come easily to people. After just a few years of college, our time, the time of this world, will be truly your time. In the letter he wrote to the church, St. Peter tells us, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope, but do it with gentleness and reverence, keeping your conscience clear. The world desperately needs you to explain your hope and the reason for it. The world desperately needs you and your gifts. It needs you to grow them and produce fruit in larger fields. As you have shared your gifts with us, and we have shared our gifts with you, share the gifts each of you has for the needs of the world that Jesus came to save. The world needs your gift of faith your witness to the eternal truth of God's love, because the world needs true love more than anything else. And faith in that love is the best possible witness, because the world you are going into has little regard for what cannot be proven or demonstrated by science, or that cannot serve utilitarian purposes. And you cannot prove love or God in laboratories or test tubes. The greatest commandment is to love God with your whole being and to love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is the image of God. The world needs good, loving neighbors. The world needs you to confirm the word of God's love in your lives. The world needs your gifts in the science and humanities because science and the world are always in danger of and from inhumanity. The world needs your courage there's a very good reason the nations of the world use young men and women to fight their wars. It's because you have courage, strong hearts. To paraphrase the soundbite from General Patton, the world needs you not to give up your life for a cause, but to live your life for a reason beyond yourself. That takes real courage. That's the reason that those apostles were relatively young, some very young, because they found the best reason to live and love for, yes, even die for. Because a love that is not worth defending unto death, when and if necessary, is not a love worth living for. The world needs your dreams and visions, because the dreams that individual and talented men and women pursue are the dreams that come true and become a reality for everyone. Now your time is coming as you enter college, to focus sharply on the sights of your dreams, dreams which you will spend your lives in bringing to reality. I hope that you find the seeds of those dreams were planted, or at least watered here in Ports of Heaven. So like those apostles turn loose into the world, be men and women full of hope. There will be good days and bad days, good times and hard times. It is hard to hope sometimes, when by all measurable means things are falling apart, when human logic tempts us to give up and say forget about it. We need what Jesus himself gave, strength, hope, and confidence. In a word, we need the Holy Spirit. Jesus made a promise to his apostles that he would not leave us orphans struggling on our own, but that he would send us an advocate, the Holy Spirit, and it is a promise he kept. So it's good advice for all of us, young and old, be men and women full of hope. May what you have learned and experienced here guide and protect you for the rest of your lives. And know that this family, the Abbey family, your family, is always here for you.